Please welcome Rosie. Hello. 15th of March, beware the Ides of March. Which actually is fairly appropriate, because what I was going to talk about this evening was fear. Not agoraphobia, but actually fear as the more or less constant travelling companion of your Arctic explorer. Especially if you're really exploring beyond the boundaries of what you think are your potential. And what fear kept me awake at night was not the macho fears of falling through the ice or dropping down into a crevasse. No, what kept me awake at night was not the spiders either. It was fear of failure, as we were talking about. And you have a lot of responsibility that you're answerable to. You don't want to fail, because there in your sledge you have your whole team, your charity, your sponsors, your teammates, your family. And they are a very important part of your expedition. I took all those people across the frozen wastelands of Antarctica with me. We shared all those adventures. I thought of them when I got into a tight hole, including even making camp one night on a covered crevasse. A night of terror, wondering when I was going to plummet through in my sleeping bag in the tent and disappear into its black depths. The Arctic, a frozen ocean as opposed to a continent, was almost terrifying comparison we're going to yearn for Antarctica. Here, nothing is predictable. It's like being in a noisy, violent war zone. And I thought I had actually bitten off more than I could chew when I set my cap at going solo. I frightened myself and I frightened everyone else, particularly the men who said it's just not physically possible. Only seven men had made it but they didn't reckon on the fact that my attitude was as big as their biceps. <laughs> my organisation wasn't quite as good, a bit of an admin nightmare, a mess even bigger than Anna's rucksack contents. But there's method in the madness here, because if you're disorganised and careless in detail with setting up a business, you could lose your shirt. In this business, you lose your life. So part of the preps were the training as well. Not just pulling a tire, if you're going to Antarctica, but the Arctic, you need all round fitness. You're going to be crawling, hauling, shoving, swimming, the works. And the stronger you get, the more it builds up your mental confidence. So appropriately for a war zone, I also trained with the military, the Military Correction Center, ACA Colchester Military Jail. It was noisy and brutal, but they really inured me, and they taught me that mantra, fall down seven times, get up eight. Should have been superwoman by the end of it, but this wonderful Hartley shop catches the last few moments before you set off. You can smell the fear. I felt fat, unfit, and frightened, not superwoman. You're dropped alone on the frozen ocean. First few minutes, transportation, wonderful. Then fear kicks in. The cold, minus 40, then minus 50, then minus 60, slaps you in the face. The human body and mind not fit to cope. You're supposed to be sharp. You've got to be alert. This is your social life. <laughs> Very good hunters. Highly developed sense of smell. And you're on the ice and you haven't had a shower for two months? Mm-mm. Not good. But, you know, frankly, I had so many other things once I got on the ice to worry about, like these monsters, up to as high as this ceiling, 50 foot high and more, pressure ridges. These are created by the combined forces of the wind and the ocean currents which slam plates of ice together with terrific force, and they send up these mountains of ice, and you and your sledge have to get over. Good news is they give way to water. The bad news is you have to get across that water. So here am I, in my head in the Côte d'Azur, <laughs> swimming across balmy straits, <laughs> hoping I don't look too much like a toxic seal to the bears. 
But I didn't want any unintended dips, so I had this very sophisticated way of testing the thickness of the ice with my ski pole. So I'd thrash the ice three times really hard. If it held, I'd go, unless there was that little telltale black sign anywhere across the ice, which meant no viscosity, uh-uh, big danger sign. The other thing that kicks in is you're in a desperate hurry because there's an undercurrent. The ocean currents are pulling you and your slab of ice further away from the pole. You'll go to bed at night in your tent, same scenery, wake up next morning, same scenery, but you'll be 10 miles behind where you started. So sleep was out of the question. <laughs> About one and a half, two hours every night. Malnutrition, bit stoned on painkillers. <laughs> It slightly warps your judgment even more than normal, and it makes you very greedy for mileage. I took a short cut across some thin ice with a telltale black line. The ice creaked, groaned, and then it broke beneath me, and I sunk in stately fashion down to my shoulders. I knew that in order to get out, I had to get my skis off, took them off, threw them across the ice, clattered over. Every time I pressed down on the ice, the ice gave way beneath me. Cross like a hippo in the water, I could see the skis, the pictures done by my son of butterflies, caterpillars. I've got to get out, and I threw myself out like a seal, because those skis represented everything that my polar predecessors fought for. The legacy of an expedition, the meaning, the love, support of your family, and it's thanks to people like my predecessors, and in particular, Henry Worsley, recently, who died on Antarctica. But in so doing, he kept a bright light on, like a beacon, to shine across the path for others to follow in his wake. Thank you.